Uh, joining me for a chat is Claudia Chender, leader of the NDP here in Nova Scotia. Claudia Chender, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Uh, great to be here, Todd. All right. So the legislation wrapped up the spring sitting. Man, it was quick, eh? Why Why are our, our sessions so short in Nova Scotia? Uh, because the government can be there as little time as is required to do the most minimum amount of work that needs to be done in the Legislative Assembly. And successive governments have figured out that the more time they're in province house, the more media scrutiny they face, the more they actually have to talk about their platforms. And so they do their best to make uh, that experience as short as possible. And in the process, I think really short change Nova Scotians in terms of our ability to understand the legislation that comes forward, which of course impacts everyone's lives. And it makes it a pretty bad workplace. So, you know, we've been putting forward legislation for years now to change that, to have a legislative calendar, which almost every other jurisdiction uh, provincially and at the federal level has in this country to ensure that we take the time that we need to consider legislation and, and do the work that we're elected to do. But it sort of seems to be seen as a bit of a convenience for the government at this point. So, do you, do you feel the liberals were, d- d- Claudia, were the liberals guilty of this as well? Oh, absolutely. I yeah. mean, I think definitely it's gotten much worse. So, if you just look by the numbers, I mean, of course, the liberals famously shut down the legislature entirely during the first year of COVID, yeah. and so that certainly was not a particularly democratic approach. Um, but, you know, I think um, extended hours have, have always been the norm in the six years I've, I've been in this role. But, but it's, it's, like I say, it's gotten much worse. So this was a budget session. Those are always longer. The hours are always longer. Um, but we don't, you know, I think in the last two sessions um, and most of the one before that, we routinely sit till 11 or 12 o'clock at night. And, and what that means is that every piece of legislation that gets passed gets passed either when people are asleep or at best when they're, you know, eating supper or putting their kids to bed or, or doing anything uh, else than paying attention to what's happening in the legislature, which we don't expect people necessarily to do. But it sure would be nice if people had the opportunity to know, uh, you know, what was happening that was going to affect their lives. And this government seems to do whatever they can to make sure that there's as little visibility there as possible. So it's pretty frustrating. All right, let's talk about uh, the the legislation that was passed. I think it was six pieces of legislation. Sure. Is that what is that what it was? Was that the grand total? That sounds right. Not yeah. very much. It was okay. a very light legislative session. Okay, is that abnormal or is that kind of normal for you know six pieces? Of, is that is that glaringly uh, glaringly a small number? It's unusual. I mean, they had a very heavy legislative session in the fall. So, you know, I would I I haven't parsed the numbers, but I would suspect that we're sort of on average probably over a longer period of time. But yes, six pieces is not much. Um, You know, I think this government is really attempting, you know, as we've talked about in the past, they've consolidated a lot of power in the executive council and in the premier's office. So they've sort of changed the structure of all the crown corporations that were previously independent. So they report up to ministers. And what that means is that they can do a lot outside of legislation. So they can just quietly pass orders in council or or other things that allow big policy shifts to happen or change regulations. There's lots of things government does that doesn't have to come to the legislature. And they're sort of seem to be designing it so that that is the case more and more. And even in terms of budgeting. So we spent, you know, most of those 14 days debating Uh, a a massive budget, many billions of dollars. But we also know that Nova Scotia is the only province where they don't have to bring additional appropriations back to the legislature. So in the last budget year, the government spent an extra $1.4 billion that Nova Scotians had no say over, that had no transparency, that had no decision making around it. Um, we just got a, you know, a photocopied double-sided piece of paper that told us what that was. So we have a real issue with accountability in this province and transparency, and it's not something people like to look at or talk about, but it's real. And it's something that, you know, we continue to push um, to make sure that Nova Scotians know what they're getting and, and understand the decisions that are affecting them. 
All right, so what was missing, in your opinion, from uh, from perhaps some legislation that didn't get passed? Oh, well, there was a lot missing. And I think as we look at this massive budget, um, it, the lack of action on housing and the cost of living was glaring. Uh, so, you know, we saw nothing budgeted to uh, build new affordable housing or really to incent any kind of affordable housing. And meanwhile, you know, I think the number of people that we know from point in time counts who are actively without any home at all is something around 800 people uh, here in HRM. Um, But we know across the province that housing affordability is a massive issue at all, uh, at all income levels, really, uh, except for obviously the highest ones. But people are struggling. People are struggling to afford housing. And the housing that's getting built for the most part is right at the top. Um, of the income spectrum, and that's not okay. And so we've really been pushing for more public housing, more nonprofit housing, um, real uh, sort of incentives that are tied to government funding for developers to build really affordable housing that people can actually get into. We didn't see anything about that. Um, and there are lots of things on affordability that government could have done right away. So you and I have talked in the past about the idea of waiving pharmacare fees. So Seniors and families on government pharmacare have huge premiums, and we know that people are choosing between taking their medicine or buying food or paying their power bill. Um, those We shouldn't have to make those kind of choices. Nova Scotians shouldn't have to make those kind of choices. So we've been calling for the government to freeze those fees and make sure people can get their meds. The government didn't act on that. So, you know, I think there were a lot, there are a lot of things that government could have done um, to help Nova Scotians who are really, really feeling the pinch of affordability. Um, and, and it was a huge missed opportunity. So we were quite disappointed in that. Uh, there was a ton of spending on health care, um, but not health care that people can count on. So that family doctor wait list is now up to 142,000. And we know so many people who are waiting to see a specialist or who have a a real issue but aren't attached to care. And so they don't know who's going to follow them, who's going to help them figure that out. Not a walk-in clinic, uh, not Maple. Um, So, you know, we saw a lot of missed opportunities in this budget. On the uh, affordability, the rent cap, they did uh, extend the rent cap and uh, Mm -hmm. raised it to 5%. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the le- the legislation actually doesn't say 5%. It just says they're going to extend the rent cap. And the government has said that in regulation, again, another thing that doesn't have to come for a legislature or be public, that they will make it 5%, at least for now. Um, well, we're glad that they extended the rent cap. But, you know, we've had a 2% rent cap and an average 9% increase year over year in rental costs. And that's because uh, for some good reasons and some bad reasons, Uh, landlords are not signing multi-year leases anymore. They're only signing fixed-term leases, in part so that they can make sure to cover their costs in this inflationary environment. But for some, to take advantage of the huge increases in in the rental market. So people are being forced to sign fixed-term leases. And so after 12 months, you're out. And your apartment might go up five, seven, nine hundred dollars for the next tenant. And this is happening all over the place. So one of the things that we really argued strongly for was to to kind of plug that loophole of the fixed term lease. Uh, If they're going to extend the rent cap, they want it to work. Now, we, of course, have been advocating not for a rent cap, but for a system of rent control so that. People have an understanding in legislation of how much their rent can rise each year. That could be tied to CPI. That could be tied to a number of things. Um, And also, you know, landlords can have some certainty. So if they're underwater and they need to make renovations to their unit, they don't have to evict someone to do that. They can apply to raise the rent to cover those costs, and and they can do that. Uh, Many other provinces across this country have that kind of system. And, you know, we have argued for years now and continue to believe that that's sort of the only way to deal with the, uh, you know, we have, I think, a 1% vacancy rate and a lot of renters in this province. Um, And we need to find a way to make sure that people can, you know, have a home they can afford, which increasingly is a huge challenge. Uh, Kalani, I appreciate your time as always. Thanks so much. 
Thanks, Todd. Okay, take care. Claudia Chender, leader of the NDP.